Hey, hello everyone, Sean Simons, PPG Grandpa. How are you doing this fine day? You will not believe who I have on the phone today. Yes, you're right. I have Andrew Fuller. He's been on the podcast. Actually, he was on the very first podcast. And if you listen to that, he really knows his stuff. So I have him on today and we're going to be talking about heat treating a paramotor and why it's better to have heat treatment on your frame than not. Andrew, welcome to the show, man. How's it going? Man, if, if it's doing any better, I'd be doing a backflip. <laughs> so the, the, the big thing I think about frames is how sturdy they are. Because I've heard that there are frames that will wobble um, if you barely bump them, they will make contact with the prop. Um, if you go full throttle and you have, uh, and you're doing a forward launch, the, the strings on the glider could warp the frame and cause an explosion or cause the contact. Why would you want to have a more sturdy frame than these kind of lighter, not really well-built, well, maybe well-built titanium and stuff like that. Why would you want to have a frame that is more heat-treated? And you were talking to me about this T1, T5. I have no idea what that is. So, Andrew, welcome to the show. We're talking about welding, heat-treating, frames on paramotors. What you got, my friend? Well, so when you order metal... Uh huh. You, you know, usually get the, like the 70, 70, 78, or like the, um, what's it called? God, man, I forgot all my medals. We're going to have to cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, so you usually get 60, 61. Right. Which is your aircraft aluminum. And it, 60, 61 is T6. It's already heat treated. But when you get it and you start bending it, like uh, when you roll cage hoops or when you have the front part of the paramotor where it curves up, anytime you bend it and you put it in a bender, uh -huh. it's, it stretches the metal on one side and then it condenses and crushes and, and makes little micro fractures in, in, on the side that's being bent, like uh, on the other side. Okay. And it's not as strong as it originally was. And then when you weld on it, then... Mm -hmm. You have within eight inches of every weld, the the metal is no longer T six. It's T nothing. Okay, so and so T six means it's air is aircraft. T six is yeah. T six is the strongest you can have for for metal. Metal and, and that's and that's aluminum to, that we're talking about, or anything, or yep, what? It's aluminum. Just aluminum. Okay. So you yeah you can't actually heat treat titanium, which is one of the reasons that we went to um, aluminum and due to t6 aluminum and some of that comes from like the bicycle industry like they used to make all the bikes out of titanium and they still make a lot of them out of high titanium but they found out with like hydro forming and heat treating you can actually make a bicycle lighter and stronger if you go out of aluminum and you do the heat treating part whereas oh. titanium once you weld on it the metal is, I wouldn't say damaged, but it's not as strong as it originally was within eight inches of the weld. And you can't heat treat titanium. So, yeah, if you're going for absolute strength at the lightest weight, then you're, then T6 is the best option. But the problem is, is once you start welding on it, it's not T6 anymore. It's, it's T nothing. It's just normal aluminum. Mm -hmm. And on every frame, there's pretty much a weld within eight inches or the, there's, there's not too many places on a frame where you don't have a weld every eight inches. Gotcha. Okay. That's, that's interesting. I, I didn't even know about that. So when you heat treat, you can heat treat it back from nothing after the bend in the weld to T2, 3, 4, 5. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much T4 and T6. Okay. And it's a two-part process. You can't go from nothing to T6. First, you have to go to T4. And what they do is they heat it up to a pretty high number. It's like a 900 or 1100 degrees. And they do it relatively quickly. It takes about 45 minutes. And they keep it in there. And what that does is it almost melts the metal. And it allows the particles to loosen up and then reform to each other. Oh, okay. and then you have, yeah, then you have to quench it. 
and they quench it in, in this solution. It's uh, it's oil. And right when you quench it, it, it sets everything in place and kind of tightens everything up, all the particles. And then it comes out of T4, and it's actually very, very soft. It takes – if you just leave it there – in about three or four days, it will age to T4. But when it comes out of quenching, the metal's still actually settling in, and the frame is very malleable. So, what we do is we go in there and we we throw it in a jig. After it comes out of T4, we let it we let it harden up for about a day, and uh, then we throw it in a jig and we make sure it's all still back in specs because sometimes with um, when it quenches. It can tweak. It can tweak parts of the frame a little bit, mm-hmm. and everything's so precise on the angel with the way it goes together. We have to make sure all that stuff doesn't move, right. come out of place. So after it comes out of T four, and we put it in our jigs, and we make sure everything's where it needs to be. We send it in for T six, also known as aging, and that's. And you have to go from T four to T six. You can't go T nothing to T six. But when it goes to T four, and they, or it's when it goes to T six. They put it in an oven for about six hours and they bring the temperature up to 600 degrees. And then when it comes out of there, it is rock solid. And you can actually feel the difference in the frames from one that's been welded and hasn't gone into T4 yet. And then one that comes out aged to T6, you can just, when you hold, you can just tell how much more sturdy it is. That's, but yeah, so when, that's interesting. So Yes, yeah, it's, it's not a cheap process, and it's a time-consuming process, too. And there's very few places in the country that actually heat-treat aluminum back to T6. There's only one place in Florida that does it, actually. Hmm. So, so yeah, that's a whole ordeal. When we do it, we send them all off, and then when it comes out of T4, we actually drive over with the jigs in the truck. And they set up a little room for us, and we, um, yeah, make sure everything's straight. And then they go to T6, and then they ship it back to us. That's really interesting. So when people say, why does it cost so much for a frame? It's just aluminum in a, in a circle. This is the reason why, because it's strong and it's not going to just crumble and fall apart in midair. Yeah, it's, um, it'll last a lot longer and there's no weak spots. So, you know, usually when you weld, the weld is the strong part, but right after the weld is weak. That's, so, that's, that's interesting because I just did a video where I compared two frames together and somebody actually saw on the other frame that I had before I got the angel, saw a crack right by the weld. So that's that's pretty interesting. I'm going to have to look into that a little bit more. So I'm glad that I got the angel frame because I plan on having it for a very long time, like forever. And, and it could last that long too. It, it, it really seems like it. It'll be very interesting to see how long these frames these frames last. And of course, if they last for a long time, they retain their value. Mm-hmm. And you save a lot of money in the long run. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Especially, especially if it's a hard to break frame like the one you have. Exactly. Now you also have a guarantee too that if you are flying and you have the cameras on you come down too hard and you break your uh your main frame you just send out a brand new one right Mm -hmm. and is there anybody else in the industry that does anything like that nope and and no one's broken one yet actually (laughs) well there you go it's and i know we Uh, we we both have a we were planning on we were planning on shipping out a couple frames it's just you know nobody's pulled it off yet and you've tried uh, you've you've asked you've asked leah right yeah, yeah, she's still up for the challenge. She, she doesn't. Um, she is a very determined individual. I uh, actually a couple weeks ago, my girlfriend pulled up, pulled out a glider. My girlfriend unpacked a glider that was so knotted up that she she did something and nobody knows what it is. And I was like, okay, nobody's gonna believe me on how tangled up this glider is unless they put their hands on it and see it. So um, I, I I had a couple buddies try and help me untangle it, and of course they were like, oh yeah, you know. It, you know, first of all, like, it's real easy. We can untangle it real easy because as long as you didn't undo any of the lines, we could find the way out. And I'm like, no, man, you don't understand how bad this is. And that's the uh, that's that little thing that you do where you hold the A's and go back to the risers. Oh, no, you can't even do that. You can't do that. Uh, wow. The, the, like, it's, it's insane. Um, yeah, you'll ne- you've never seen anything like this before. Well, I took it over when I was doing acro training with Leah. I took it to her. And, of course, she was like, oh, I can get that undone. Let me see it. And I pulled it out. And, uh, 
she was like, oh, my God, this is this is the worst I've ever seen. This is way worse than anything I've ever even heard of. And sure enough, she took it home and she's got it like 80 percent untangled. Like she spent about six hours on it one day with me and then she took it home and she's almost finished. Like she's going to figure it out. But yeah, she doesn't live too far away from me. And we actually trained Acro this last weekend and the weekend before that. And she still, every time she sees me, she's like, all right, when I make it over to your flying field and we're actually doing motoring instead of paragliding, she's going to give it another shot to break it. And if anybody can do it, it's, it's her. <laughs> I don't know. I think, um, we, we know, we know a mutual friend that is, uh, that can pretty much damage some frames and I'm pretty much out there too for, for the challenge of, I've butt landed, butt skidded, turtled, you know, so now that I have this frame, we're going to see if it can hold up to, to old PPG grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> now I know a lot of newbies that are probably listening to this going, Oh my God, I, I don't want to worry about a wing and having it all tangled up. If you're just flying normally, what are the chances of you messing up a line? And if you do, how easy is it to undo? When you're flying normally, it's 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 impossible, pretty much. As as long as you don't, the only way to really tangle up a glider is if you just bunch the whole thing up like dirty laundry and toss it in a bag, and then somebody else undoes it and they're not sure what's going on and they just start pulling on lines and pulling risers through lines. Uh, it's very very rare. I haven't had like a tangled glider situation. I can't remember the last time I had a tangled glider situation. And this was, this case was something my girlfriend did. Um, and I'm actually kind of proud of her for it because I've never seen anything like it. So for the, for the average pilot, it's, it's so bad that nobody would believe me unless they actually put their hands on it. I hope that you did a video. Yes. Oh, well, good. it's still not finished yet, but yeah, there's already like, we're gonna have to do a massive time lapse because there's already like 12 man hours put into it holy smokes but it's a true phenomenon it's almost like the lines are spliced together like you you, like they go into they go into bunches and knots and you'll follow a line and then it just goes into this rat's nest and you can't find where it comes out wow yeah it's 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 insane it's it's you'll see you'll see the video now the only time that i ever got my lines twisted up and it was if I took out my risers before I pulled them out straight out of the bag, one could have flipped underneath or something like that. So it was no big deal. And then most of the times it's when I butt land and the glider shoots above me and lands in front of me. And then I unclip and just, you know, ball it up and move it so it's out of the field, get it out of the way of other people. And then when I try to untangle it, it's like it's tangled up. But there is a secret is there not to untangle a kind of messed up line? Yeah. Um, you, you get, you get, if you lay the wing out and you just grab like the inside a, you, you lay it out like it's like it's in a wall, right? Uh huh. With, yep. with the A's on top. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when it's tangled, you grab, you just take your one a and you follow that from the glider from the risers to the glider and usually that will tell you what's tangled because i usually go from the glider to the riser and then i just shake that a and it just kind of falls out is that what you're saying that's that's another way if you grab it and you work it down and you hold it up by that one a line you can kind of see what's going on i haven't i haven't Uh, i haven't done it your way so explain your way i i lay it out like it's uh, the best the best I can based on how it's tangled. Uh-huh. And I just grab the, you know, I usually don't figure it out until I grab the risers and I pull the risers and then I can see that there's a line over or a line through. Mm-hmm. And I, it's so me, hard to I, explain I, it on a yeah, podcast. It's so hard to me, I just look at it. I look at it and, and I can usually just whoop right, right out. Um, and there's, there's yeah. videos out there. If you search for how to untangle riser, you'll probably find it. It's really, really amazingly easy. I never have to worry about riser twists or not riser twists. Uh, my, my lines being twisted up anymore with that. Yeah. Little secret. yeah hers, hers, this was so ratted up that the, the riser was two feet away from the wingtip. Holy so smokes. Big, what the hell did yeah. they do? We don't know. We, we can't even, um, 
we can't even think of how it's possible. You have to see it like half the lines on one riser go through the other riser hmm. and then back not like halfway through. So you can't even, she was actually able to get the, one of the risers isolated, which was a huge, um, a huge move. But I asked her how she did it. She's like, I don't know, man. I was, I was working on it for like eight hours. That's crazy. <laughs> but it's strung up all over, just like it was in my house when we were, trying to get it undone it's like strung out like once you get a line clear you, you like you hang it over like the edge of the couch and then once you get another group of risers you know it's all so it's all spread out so they're not as big as possible so is this something you that your company does uh as a service no no this was um nobody will ever be able to recreate this i promise I mean, does does your does your company for a service untangle line twists or the line riser or just twist in in a in a glider? I mean, if if you're out at a field and your glider's twisted, I can I can walk over and and pretty much untwist it no matter how bad you got it in just a couple minutes. Oh, okay. So fly with Andy yeah. Fuller. I would never charge anybody for something like that. They showed it to me, and this is this this goes with majority of paraglider pilots and instructors and stuff when you when you say man my, my wings twisted up my lines are twisted up they're gonna come over and be like all right this is how you're supposed to pack it up and this is how you do it right and usually the person's like i know i was in a hurry <clears throat> and you just untwist it really quick but this one was so bad and because everybody's like oh i can untwist gliders so quick and i can un and, and me personally i can untwist them very quick but because this one was so bad i was like okay I have got to show people about this. You know, I've, got show, I've got to let, cause like Leah would never believe me that it was as bad as it was unless she gave it a shot. Well, we definitely need to and, see a video on that. How would we yeah. be, how would we get to your YouTube channel to, to see this video eventually? Uh, Sky tap paramotors. So just search for Sky tap paramotors on YouTube. And we can also well, go to your website tap. by going to www.skytapparamotors.com. And at the very bottom is a link to your YouTube and Instagram and Twitter, right? Yep. All right. So back to heat treating and unheat treating. Man, we went off on a tangent, but that's cool. It's, it's, mm. it's always fun to talk about stuff. Um, so when you get the... Aircraft aluminum, it's at T6, and when you bend it all up and put it in a roll and do the things that you want to do with it, it goes down to T nothing. And then you have yep. to, when you weld it, you have to put it in the furnace, and it, that's a huge process. It'll bring you up to T4, and to bring it back up to T6 is another process that takes more time and that's when we said that this is the reason why it costs so much for these frames now there's some frames out there that are not like this how, how do they make them they just make loops and they put like fishnet around them how does that work yeah i mean they just they just take the metal and they just weld it and then paint it you know we do the extra step of you know welding bending and then the heat treating part and then we paint it paint it so it, it depends on, you know, if you want it to be, you can build frames strong. You just have to use a lot more metal and it'll weigh more, which mm -hmm. is part of the reason why the Angel is lighter than a lot of frames out there because we heat treat it. We don't have to use as much metal to get even more strength, but it's, it's just more expensive for us to do it that way as opposed to using a lot more metal that's thicker and not heat treating it. Then it would just be heavier. I was actually surprised. I actually weighed the frame against the other uh, frame that's out there that's supposed to be, you know, really super strong. And the Angel actually came out to be lighter uh, with just the frame and uh, also lighter with the frame and the harness, which was very interesting. And we're only talking about a half a pound or a pound. So we're not talking about, you know, a massive amount of weight. And you can shave off even more weight by only putting a gallon of gas in your gas tank than two and a half gallons. So there's ways of shaving off weight off of, you know, you flying. It's not yeah, you can light, light, lightweight material reserves, right? Knock off a few more pounds. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, you know, I'm not too worried about the weight because, you know, when you're talking about five pounds overall, that shouldn't be a big difference. When weight starts to bother me is when like there's certain engines out there, like the Simonini, which is a great, reliable engine. 
quite possibly the most reliable engine out there for for two stroke but it's 12 pounds heavier than a Viterazzi. Hmm. And now, now you're looking at a significant weight difference to where you'd rather have a Viterazzi, which is just as powerful. It's, parts are significantly more available. And it's almost, it's almost as reliable. Um, but 12 pounds lighter makes a huge difference. Especially when it's the motor, because the motor is the furthest thing away from the hang point and in the, the, the center of the frame. So it's, it's having, you know, having weight in the frame, which is wrapped around the pilot is a little different than having an engine that adds 12 extra pounds of weight. Exactly. Exactly. Cause it hangs back and creates leverage and makes it feel even more heavy. I've shaved off a bunch of weight off of myself, even though I haven't changed, you know, body weight. I get these boots that are lighter than shoes. I wear parachute pants instead of jeans, you know, and um, lighter weight uh, jackets to keep me warm. And I shaved off a bunch of pounds. Um, and I can also go from, you know, two and a half gallons that I normally fly with, I can go down to a gallon. But I honestly, I don't feel the difference. And just like I was telling you, you know, a lot of these people that are having issues with frames and how heavy they are is because they put them on their back. I got the darn notifications on. Let me turn that off. So what I do is I use a wheeled dolly to wheel my paramotor out to the field. Um, I kite my wing and then clip the wing into the motor or into the frame. And then I sit in the frame, clip in, stand up, go full throttle, and I'm up in the air. So I don't even hold it on my back very long. These other people are, are putting them on their back, and they're walking out to where they are. They're even kiting their wing with it, and then they bend down and they clip in, which to me is just a ridiculous amount of time to be carrying 50 or 60 pounds on your back. Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can walk pretty far with my frame on my back, but it's just unnecessary. Exactly. And for us old farts, you know, you're, you're young, you know, young and I'm, I'm 50 years old. And of course there's people out there like 50 years old, but when you get up there, you don't want to be holding 50 or 60 pounds on your back while you're clipping in. It's so much nicer just to sit in there, you know, clip in, stand up, go full throttle and you're up in the air. So, I mean, you're only holding it on your back for less than a minute. Yeah. I think the reason why a lot of people do that is because of the way that their paramotor is designed with such a low seat mm -hmm. where if you get out there in the field to put the motor on, you'll have to sit with your butt almost on the ground. And it's kind of hard to get out of that. Isn't that kind of dangerous? If you come down and do a butt landing, you actually would be kind of crushing your back and spine instead of, you know, letting the paramotor take the, uh, the wrath of it. Yes. You would have, um, your butt would take, would take the, all the weight. I mean, that could be added weight from the inertia of the swing. Because a lot of times when people hit the ground, it's on a it's on a surge where they're swinging out. And a lot of times people try and save it by hitting the throttle. So now you're looking at extra moment, momentum from the swing, um, the extra motor from the weight in the cage, you know, an extra 50, 60 pounds. Right. And then also the thrust of the motor, which depending on how much throttle you're giving it, could be up to like 160 pounds of thrust. And if you hit and your butt's the first thing to hit, then yes. or your frame isn't strong enough and it just crushes right through the frame and then and then you take it on the butt, yeah, you can get some pretty serious injuries. That's like that's like jumping off your house and landing on your butt. Yes. Um all the all paragliding harnesses, with the exception of like some split leg harnesses and some hike and fly harnesses that are meant to be minimal, minimal weight because people are going to be hiking up, you know, thousands of feet to that perfect little launch spot to, to do a speed ride down. Right. Every other harness though has some sort of protection underneath your butt. So if they're trying to save weight, they have an inflatable airbag. So as soon as you're moving forward, it has a one way vent that lets air in and it fills up about, like an 18 inch airbag underneath your butt. Wow. And it looks like, yeah, it looks like you're flying around with a, with a cocoon on your back. Cause it comes all the way up to the top of your shoulders. I see and, that. I thought that was just like foam or something. Uh -uh. And then the other ones like acrobatic harnesses, mm -hmm. which acrobatic and freestyle, they actually have foam. They'll have like eight inches of foam under the butt 
and it goes all the way up to about the middle part of your back. And they do this because acro guys are coming in trying to do fancy landings, uh, and they're more likely to hit the ground because they're training acrobatics and they might come down into reserve and stuff. So Mm -hmm. they have all this foam and this padding to protect your back and your butt. And then a lot of paramotors don't have that, but it's something that's pretty much required for people to like, if you're looking for harnesses in, in the free flight world and it doesn't have spine and butt protection, then you're, you're asking for it. You know, you're not going to purchase that, that harness because it doesn't have any protection because everybody knows you're going to have a bad landing. You're going to have a bad takeoff at some point and you're going to hit your, you're going to hit the bottom of the harness and hopefully there's padding there. So I haven't the seen paramotor- any, I haven't seen any paramotors that have a way of cushioning a butt landing at all. It, the only thing I saw like is with your frame where you have feet where if you do hit, you got a, a, a zone that crumples and takes all the impact and you don't have to worry about just, just landing on your butt. Yeah. Like foam, foam in an airbag won't stop the extra weight of the paramotor. Right. It's not enough. Um, so you have to have a zone that crumples kind of like your car in a high impact like that to protect your spine. Yes. Yeah, so you, yeah, you want, you want the material under there. Uh, part of the reason that we heat treat it is so when you hit it, there's no weak spots. It will actually crush instead of having weak spots like around the welds where like the weld will break on impact. Oh yeah. That so, would be good because that'd be like a sharp edge that could break apart and stab you. Yeah. And it, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't, and it wouldn't crush like together, you know, like if there's a weak spot, the metal will break in, in one or two spots and then it's not going to actually crush. It'll kind of, nullifies the point of doing it you know, the, yeah you want to yeah you want to have it you want to have all the metal equally strong so it's like crushing a, a soda can right where it it stays together but it crushes interesting sounds like you're eating yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so a lot of the things i do in paramotoring or what i use to gauge in paramotoring yeah is uh, what the free flight guys do. So with, you know, free flight guys practicing acrobatics, two reserves. So when I, when I fly, I have two reserves with my motor. They all have spinal butt and back protection on nearly every single paramotor harness unless it's a hike and fly. So I put back and spinal protection on our frames. That reminds me, um, reserves. How do you judge the size that you need and when would you actually need a reserve? I've been flying for over 20 hours, uh, which is many months, and I don't have a reserve. But I've also been flying in pretty good weather, which is, you know, butter smooth. When would I need to go and look into getting a reserve and what size do I need to get in general? You know, because I know there's a lot of people out there that may not even know um, how to, how to get a, um, a correct size reserve. I say go big on reserves. Some people try and get the smallest reserve that they're rated for. Um, but they go down quick, right? That's like 5.5 meters a second, which is almost 12 feet a second. Right. And that means that you're you're pretty much just dropping down. Like you're jumping off a, uh, a house that's about 12 feet, right? So you're going to land hard on those reserves. I'd say it's probably about the impact speed of jumping, doing a good jump off the back of your truck. But doing a good jump off the back of your truck with just a free flight harness on is a completely different game than putting your paramotor on and jumping off the back of your truck. You know, your ankles could your ankles and everything and your knees can handle you jumping off the back of a truck. You add an extra 60 pounds and you jump off the back of the truck that could break your ankle. Ah, yeah. I didn't Plus you're not that. able to tuck and roll already like a PDF landing. Right. Um, you know, to kind of, kind of save your ankles. So if you have an angel, we suggest you stay in the seat and let the frame, let the frame do what it's going to do. And and, 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 and that way when you're sitting there, you're kind of leaning back just a hair. So the, the you're not going to hit anything. I mean, the whole frame is going to take the impact. Right. 
because um, didn't you didn't you have that angled a little bit differently because there's other uh frames out there that when you throw the reserve you're leaning forward and you right. were like oh hell no i want to lean a little bit backwards to make sure the frame takes all the impact well what can you tell me more about that yeah we just want so if you stay a lot of some of the other frames if you stay in your seat under reserve then you lean forward and you don't have the option to take it on the frame um and if you lean, if you're under reserve on our frame and you get out of your seat, you know, you want to do exactly what I told you not to do. And you, and you want to get out of your seat, it'll be, you can still do the PDF or it'll still be where you have your feet underneath you. But if you stay seated, then it's pretty much lined up with your balance point on normal flying. So you're leaned back a little bit, just slightly. And you stay in your seat and you just crush that crush that cage and get it on video and send us the video and we'll send you out another cage. You know? So even if you pull a reserve and you come down and crush your cage, you still take care of us. Oh, absolutely. Man. That's one I'd really like. That's one I'd really like to see. So if you guys are out there right now listening to this and you want to get yourself a SkyTap angel frame, tell Andrew Fuller that you heard PPG Grandpa talk to you about this and he will give you $200 off a complete setup just because you're listening to this podcast. Don't tell anybody about this this is only for you and uh, give andrew a call and say hey man i i want one of these frames now how would they be able to get up with you through your website correct yep through the website you can find me on facebook contact me through youtube um give me a call however you'd like all right that's that's awesome um so back to the reserve how big Actually, how big are they one, how big are they oh, and i'm sorry oh one other one other side note on um, impacting the ground with frames. Yeah. For it to really work properly, you need to have fixed hang points because fixed hang points allows you to be elevated off the ground consistently, you know, cause it's, and it keeps your back off of the back of the frame. If you have swing arms and you come down and the cage hits first, then the swing arms are going to lose their tension because now you're on the ground and you're not hanging from the swing arms anymore mm -hmm. and you're actually going to swing in and then your butt will hit the ground or you're going to swing in and your back is going to hit the back of the frame and you can actually injure your back that way. So in the older paragliding days, when they, before they had figured out about having the spinal protection, they were actually putting like plastic, molded pieces to fit your back in the harness and their 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 logic was you know we'll have this like little cast on the back side of the harness behind the padding so if you hit there's something solid there to prevent your back from breaking what was happening though was people's backs were breaking because of that molded hard piece because their backs were actually breaking on that molded hard piece that doesn't sound good yeah, so they took that out. So that's another reason why we like the harness off of the back of the frame. So when you hit something, you only deal with the harness. You don't deal with your back hitting that, that part of the frame. And with those um, comfort bars, too, if you do hit hard and then you bounce forward, those comfort bars will keep you from the motor and everything crushing you, right? Yep. Because you're leaning forward on the comfort on bars. Base when, yeah, when people go down forward, they put their hands out. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of thrust and pressure and weight on on your hands. And you can't stop it. It's, it's going to push all the way through until your hand is crushed up on your body, and then it'll break your your wrist or sprain at least sprain your wrist. So when we have those, those comfort bars out in front, you might stick your hand out past those comfort bars. But before it can crush your arm up on your body – the frame is going to absorb the rest of that pressure and your arm is free to move in there. It's not going to get, you know, pinned up against your chest. And if the motor is still running, as soon as you open up your hand to land flat down, the trigger goes to a locking um, point to where when you slam down, it doesn't go full throttle. Yes. And I have not seen any other throttle out there that's similar. Is there any ones that are out there, like on maybe a Scout or something? How are, how are those done? If you lean forward, you're going full throttle, right? There's not even locking mechanism? Or is there? Yeah, we have, on the back of our throttle, we have a safety that's similar to the safeties on most 
pistols these days. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if you just pull the trigger, it won't shoot. But if you're holding the gun in your hand, it allows the trigger to be pulled. Gotcha. And, and most other throttles out there are bicycle brake throttles. And they do not have anything like that. It's just an open throttle. So no matter if it's in your hand or not in your hand, you can operate the throttle. And that's that's another reason why I got this angel too, because you know, I'm I'm old. I, I know that I'm gonna, you know, do something stupid. I'm not young like Tucker that can land and hit all these these landings like a butterfly and you know, I I can trip and fall and land in, and land on my face, but even if I do, I don't have to worry about it. And pretty much everything that I said I wasn't going to do, like turtle or butt land or skid off or 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 sit down early, I've done it all. I even fell forward and nothing happened. So the frames that are made to take abuse and you replace them if we come down too hard and crush a and crush the main frame, I mean, why would anybody get any of these other paramotors that are out there. I, I don't understand because they're lighter. What, what's the difference between a lighter one and, and the angel? I, you know, I think it's just they're lighter. I, one of the selling points on other frames, and it's, it's genius because it's, it's simple and, it, and, it's, and it's a first impression sell mm -hmm. is you say, Hey man, look how comfortable this thing is on your back. See that? Don't you like that? Isn't that great? Yeah. Some of them are heavier. You're like, well, you know, this feels real good on my back, you know? And that's the main thing that people are, that's the main thing you hear people talk about on motors. And they're not really, they're not really concerned as much about the performance. Um, the angel, that's its weakness, is it, when you put it on your back, because of all the safety, the way it's all tied in to the fixed hang points and it's sitting lower to protect you from when you hit the ground, it doesn't feel as comfortable on your back as some of these these other frames there is some, some of them most of them are even lighter the that new, actually light, that light new harness that new harness that you uh, that you got me i mm -hmm. i love it it does not feel like there's a lot of pressure on my back anymore or my shoulders yeah i'll tell you that, that harness does make a big difference it gets it down pretty close to feeling like the other ones but still not quite as good you know especially if you try out one of those really lightweight ones with like a, a lightweight motor like a adam 80 mm-hmm then it really feels light. And, you know, you're selling this to people that haven't even flown yet. Uh, yeah. So they don't, they don't know how to, they can't take it up there and test it. And then you have guys that have flown one frame and, you know, it takes about a year. I wouldn't say that long, depending on how your training comes from. It takes a little while for you to realize what you like and you don't like, and you actually have to fly a lot of different gear, you know, so you can actually have, data points to to make decisions off of right. so when people are starting out they don't have any data points they go for you know what what does this person fly or what does my instructor suggest and all this the the angel because of the way it's set up with its with its hang points and how it weight shifts and all that will outperform every other frame on the market in terms of weight uh weight shift balance thrust point I mean, it can just, it can out turn like a lot of these swing arm frames because they offset the weight shift to counter prop torque. They can only actually weight shift one direction. And the way you weight shift that one direction is you actually have to lift up one leg and push the other leg down. That's the weight shift. That's a leg exercise. Mm -hmm. Weight shift is when you just roll your hips to one side of the frame and the other side of the frame. And, yeah, and so. I noticed that too with, with this harness is all I have to do is move my butt a little bit to the right or move, move my butt to the left. And the whole thing is turning so nice. I was, I was so impressed because you, because it's been cold. I, I usually get up in the air. I stow my brakes, put my hands in my pocket and I weight shift. When I first tried your harness, I was amazed at how well it shifted compared to, I mean, the same frame that I was, that I was flying before, but just changing the harnesses was night and day. I mean, it's like the difference between going from a Yugo to a Mercedes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we put up, we actually started prototyping harnesses all the way back in 2016. Wow. That was the longest part of it. Um, 
so it was basically three years on prototype in the harnesses and two years of prototype in the frame. That's so, interesting. I, I, you know what I want to do? I, I want to get up in the air with this frame and throw a reserve, but I want to land, you know, I, I don't want to land hard. Um, what are the sizes that are out there and, and what kind of reserve do you think would be good? The sizes go all the way up to 40 or 55 square meters. That's a tandem. Uh huh. And I won't hesitate to fly with my tandem solo flight. Because if I throw, I want to come down like the Apollo. Right. Nice and Because no matter what, you're going to come down faster than you want. So I say get the biggest reserve you can you can stand. I think Woody Gamertag uh, went down with a reserve recently, and he put that on video. Woody is really into <clears throat> excuse me. Woody is really into um, reserves and having big reserves and nice reserves. It's, I, I really appreciate that about him. A lot of people just get whichever reserve just so they have it, so they can say they have one. Right. Woody actually looks into, and he, he goes, he goes big. He goes oversized on reserves. And he's a, you know, he's a, he's a pretty good sized guy. Um, so he's going to fly a big reserve anyways, but he'll just get the biggest one anyways that he can get. The biggest solo reserve anyways, because when you're coming down, especially on land, you want it to be as soft as possible. And my logic is, if I throw one, if I throw one and the first one opens, I'm going to throw the second one too. Really? Why? Just, just so I come down slower. Aha, that makes sense. You don't have, now I heard that when there's like, if you throw a reserve, you got to pull your glider in. If not, it will spin around. If you have two reserve, uh, that doesn't, that won't do the same thing because it, they're round or what? Round or square, they won't do it. Um, the only time you don't want to do it is if you throw one and it's a regalo like a steerable reserve, uh -huh. then you want to fly that steerable. Then you don't want to throw your secondary one. Gotcha. But you do, you don't have to disable your glider depending on what it's doing. It can lock out. Right. So if your glider, so where, where that will happen is if somebody throws a reserve too early and then their main glider opens back up like completely and it's a full flying wing and then it can lock out against your main reserve. But if you get your glider in a tangled mess from, you know, doing a botch in a helicopter, then it's a tangled mess and it, and it can't repower itself and it can't reinflate because it's got lines wrapped over the top of it and all that. So then it won't lock out against you. Okay. But the way, the way I prefer to disable is you just have the brakes and you just take a bunch of wraps on the brakes and I, I don't pull the glider in and put it in my lap. Some people do that. No, no, no. I just wrap the brakes, take three or four wraps on the brakes, and it keeps the glider in a stall, and we call it a stall ball. And it's just the glider with too much brake pressure for it to reinflate, and it just sits there and basically comes down next to you. So I guess if you're going down into trees, pull that glider in, keep it on your lap. That way your your main glider doesn't get destroyed. And if your reserve gets all messed up, who cares? Just go buy another reserve. Right. Yeah. If you're going to make it, if you're doing a tree landing, then you want to try and get that glider close to you because the glider is more expensive than a reserve. And that's always the hard part about tree landings is getting some, getting the glider out. Sometimes you have to cut the tree down. You know? Holy smokes. Now, if if you're going down and, and you get all strung up with a reserve in the trees, it's it, it's not really worth your time to getting it fixed? It's just better to go get a new one? Or what do you think? It, dep it depends on the damage. Um, I'm not sure I would cut down a big tree to get my reserve back. Gotcha. Uh, I might just tear it out. I might just tear it out of there and destroy it, tearing it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like my $4,000 glider lands in a tree and we're coming back with a chainsaw that night. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. So, um, so get the, so get the biggest reserve. You will be, you will be so surprised at what a glider can take before <laughs> it tears or when it does tear, like you're pulling them out of trees and you're like, oh my gosh, this thing is going to be total. And you get it out and you lay it out and you're like, oh man, I just got this little tear. Who's got, the, who's got glider tape? Who's got the glider tape? Yeah, I'll fix this right now. Do you have to worry about the uh, the strings then? If you're pulling it out of the um, out of there, would you want to send it back just to make sure that all the strings are the right lengths? Depends on the wing. You know, if it's a competition wing with uh, lightweight race lines, then yeah, I'd send it off for inspection. 
if it's your normal beginner intermediate wing with cheat lines or an acro wing with overbuilt lines, just visually inspect it. Okay. That's interesting. So get the biggest reserve, um, find a frame that's, uh, that's at least T6 welded. And how, how would you find that out? Would you just talk to the manufacturer or, or is it actually mm-hmm. on, um, on a sheet someplace where, where they tell about the motor and frame or what? Usually they have it on their websites. Like people like to brag about what they make their frames out of. Oh, okay. You know, whether it's, uh, the 7071 aluminum, which is another, which is another, um, real strong aluminum but you can't heat treat it and then you have actually i think you can heat treat 7071 hmm. and then there's 60 there's 6061 which is the aircraft aluminum but yeah you just just call them up no nobody else really heat treats their frames but it's always good to check gotcha well how about how about the netting i've i've seen a lot of people um oh and, what, that... and one more and one more and one more note on that heat treating thing yeah if your frame isn't built for protection like with the you know, with a lot of frame underneath you to protect you from hitting the ground, then it's not necessarily necessary to heat treat it because it's not going to protect you anyways. Ah, uh, okay. Part of, you know, part of the reason we heat treat ours is so it, it works as designed with no weak spots to protect you. But if, if it doesn't have, if you don't have any frame down there anyways to protect you anyways, then it doesn't matter if it's heat treated or not because you're still going to hit your butt. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I've seen some people that are buying some used motors and the netting is just flopping around in the back. Um, how tight do you need to keep these, uh, these, um, uh, nettings so your hand doesn't go through? I like, so I weigh about 160 pounds, mm-hmm. which is about the thrust of a Viterazzi. And I say your netting should be strong enough that, and tight enough to where you can't put your hand on the prop, put your hand on the netting, and push the two together. No, because usually when you're going to contact the prop, you're at full throttle, so mm-hmm. you got to think you have 160 pounds of thrust moving forward. And if you do something like your elbow gets stuck out there, or you put your hand out on the netting to block it from crushing your face, right? Then the netting should be strong enough to withhold that thrust at any point of the netting uh, with an object about the size of your hand. Okay, so um, let's see. So sometimes if you pull that netting really tight, it might warp the frame. I've heard some people, they don't want it really that tight because it'll warp the frame. Yeah, or, to, or you just can't do it. Right. If you don't have the netting on each individual cage piece, then you, you'll never be able to get it that tight. If you wrap the fishnet around there and they have that one string that you tighten, you can, you'll never be able, you'll probably never be able to get it over maybe 30 pounds. It probably won't be able to hold back more than 30, maybe not even that much. But 30, because, 30 pounds should be able to hold your hand back and stuff though, right? No. No? No, because when you're going to block it is when it, when it goes to throttle. Ah. Uh, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to come at you at idle. Right. It's but if you, at- but if you're up in the air and your hand goes back, just, I don't know, to stretch, your hand's not going to go back into the prop. No, That's and it good. should, as soon as you touch the netting on those frames, it should alert you like, hey, uh, wrong direction, but, you know, it should be, the, for me, the propeller is the thing I'm most conscious about. So what it, So what have you done on your frame to to make sure that people are safe with the netting? With netting, it's, it's strung to each individual cage piece. It's 500 pound test Kevlar. It's pop riveted in all around the outside of the cage. And at all, at all the, where the netting meets the cage, it's pop riveted in. So, so that's, it's, it's strong enough. It's, yeah. It's strong enough. You can stand on it. <clears throat> so you wouldn't have to worry uh, about your hand going through or, or your, or your um, throttle going through or anything like that. Right. That's good. And you said you uh, can, a, did you just say you can stand on it? Oh yeah. So it's not going to warp the frame. Mm-mm, no, no, no. So we have double hoops mm-hmm. and double hoop is usually about four times stronger than just a single hoop. And then on top of that, instead of having spokes that are held in a place by net, by netting tension, mm-hmm. uh, everything's, everything has certs. There's five connection points, five certs for each five cage pieces. 
and there's four Velcros per cage piece. I've noticed that it's uh, pretty darn tight, and I think I saw you doing pull-ups on the knitting, and somebody was playing tennis with these pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when we string it up, we string it up really nice and tight. Like, we hang a weight off the end of the line after we run all the Kevlar through, and we have a pop riveted it down. We hang a weight, and we just, with our hands, we just grab and pull and stretch the netting all the way through. So it's already tight very tight that's good so when people are getting into ppg and they're looking around and they want to know what the the best frame is and the best motor and the harness and all that stuff the the harness the frame the throttle and harness frame throttle what else am i missing and the cage they're all different and you can pretty much piece together anything that you want you can have like uh, the angel frame with a Moster 185 or a 205 um, or, or a Thor, anything that you want to. And you don't even need to keep this angel um, harness. You can do any type of harness that you want to on there and any type of throttle you want. If you want a bicycle throttle, you can do a bicycle throttle. So when people are asking what's the best, what's the safest, what's the lightest, you know, I mean, how, how do people actually go about knowing what's the – the best and the safest um you just you gotta you just gotta weed through all the answers i hear you you know because nobody's gonna nobody's gonna tell you that you, they're not gonna tell you that yeah our frame is less safe right they might say you don't need that safety uh but, but they're not gonna say yeah that one is significantly safer it has a infinitely stronger netting with infinitely more protection from the propeller where, you know, nobody's going to, nobody's going to shoot themselves in the foot like that. So for me, it's just, you got to work. You just got to work through all the answers. You know, if it makes sense that you have individual cage pieces pop riveted uh, or 500 pound test Kevlar pop riveted into each individual cage piece. And that's obviously much stronger than, just having the fishnet stretched around one fishnet stretched around all the entire cage. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, you use common sense when they say you don't need to worry about that. You might, you might want, you might want to worry about it. And if you do, if you do, you know where to go. Yeah. Like one of the, one of the ones that really bothers me, um, I get depressed just talking about it. Is there certain frames and they have very loose netting. Yeah. Uh, or it's, and it has big gaps in it. And it's not real tight. They can't get it tight. And you have to actually hold the throttle a certain way. Um, I saw like, that on YouTube. Yeah. And if you don't hold it the right way, then the throttle cable will go into the propeller. And so their, their, their way that they fix that is they just tell you to hold the throttle a certain way rather than fixing the substance of the problem, which is there's giant holes in your netting that the throttle cable can fit through and your netting's not tight. Um, and it, and it blows my mind every time I see somebody purchase one of these, these cages because they're light, right? Not even that light. It might, it might be a pound lighter than mine. Same engine, uh, almost no weight shift. I've actually tested this motor with three different instructors, three different dealers. Mm Mm-hmm. Because, you know, they, they, we'd be talking paramotors and stuff, and I would be like, you know, based on based on what I'm looking at in your design, I don't see how it's going to weight shift that well. And they're like, oh, man, it's just like free flight. That's when you know somebody doesn't know what they're talking about, if they say it's just like free flight. Right. Because there's no such thing as a paramotor that's just like free flight. The closest paramotor to free flight is the angel, because we have the same weight shift as, the, as free flight. Because you roll your weight to one side of the frame or the other, and that's how you weight shift in the angel. Whereas the swing arm frames, for one, the weight shift is already offset to counter the prop torque. And two, you can lean all you want, but if you don't lift your leg up, then that swing arm can't come up to cause the weight shift. And to counter the torque on the angel, you have ATLs. You have ATLs. Or you can actually offset your hook ends. That doesn't sound fun. No, it's actually, it works really well. I don't know. I, 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 I like it even on both sides. And if I want to do something, I, I'll, I'll pull the trimmer out uh, maybe just a little bit if I'm not flying perfectly straight. 
but so far I, I, I think, I think. Yeah. So you know how like on, um, like single engine Cessnas and stuff, they, they offset the propeller direction to counter torque. Right. It doesn't come straight back. It comes slightly off to the side. But that's when fixed wing. Wait, yep. Right. Well, on the, on the paramotor, if you do, you know, so we have six little hooking slots. If you go, and you're probably on number three, if you go two and three, it'll slightly offset the propeller thrust and you'll fly pretty much straight. But the problem is it's not laminar. Right. The good thing is when you come off the throttle, you're still flying straight, but it's not laminar, meaning it at 25% throttle, it's still pushing the same way. And at 75% throttle, it's still pushing the same way. Whereas ATLs, they, um, they're, you know, however much throttle you give, the more they work. And ATLs mean what? Anti-torque lamels. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're just little yeah, so plastic so things that... A, they're just little oh, plastic yeah. things that, that fit on your cage, right? Yeah. Yeah, simple and easy, and they work really well. Yeah, I can't wait to go out with... with uh, I'm putting on my ATLs and uh, going out flying. It looks like Saturday. This next Saturday coming up is going to be a good fly day, so I can't wait to do a comparison between, you know, two frames, uh, the same motor and two different harnesses. That would be pretty interesting to see what the difference is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, so, so back to that one frame, I tested three different times, but that, the, the first time I flew it, I flew it and I was like, man, I must, I have to be missing something here because there's people saying great things about it and I am not understanding what they're talking about. So I reached out to three dealers and they're like, yeah, man, come on by. We'll make sure everything's fitted right. And, you know, and I felt, I felt kind of stupid doing it because I was like, you know, I, I, I know a lot about motors and frames and stuff, but this one stuck out as exceptionally not really good. And um, I went and flew it with another guy. And I actually spent about an hour at a fly-in with one of the dealers. And I flew it around. I come down landed and um, kind of adjusted some stuff. I ended up taking off the torch strap. Like, they actually have a strap. To prevent your weight shift to counter prop torque, which wow, I thought was really weird. That is weird. Yeah, so I had to, I had to pull that off and loosen up the harness, and I flew it around for like forty five minutes. Came down, landed. We talked with it afterwards, and then I did that one more time, and I'm like, you know, it's, it's not me. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, but the, but every single one of them told me it's just like free flight, and uh, one of them has never even free flown, so I don't know where he got that information from, but. It, it definitely was not like free flight. Nothing really is. Even the Angel, as good as weight shift it has, it's as close as it gets to, to free flight, but there's still the extra weight. You know, so in free flight, when you weight shift, you're weight shifting your weight and the harness. Everything moves. In paramotoring on our frame, you weight shift you and the harness, and the frame weight shifts with you. Whereas if you have swing arms... You weight shift and the harness weight shifts with you, but the frame doesn't weight shift. So you and, can't and get as much. So hard to explain this on a audio podcast than actually yeah. showing what we are talking about. And Andrew and I, we're going to be putting together some videos here in the future. And if you want to see them, go to ppggrandpa.com and we'll post them there. And we'll also post them on SkyTap Paramotor. Uh, or is it SkyTap Angel YouTube? Yep, SkyTap Angel is the YouTube. SkyTap Angel on YouTube and SkyTapParamotors.com is the website. But we're definitely going to be putting together some some videos that will actually explain um, the difference. But uh, if you're interested in getting one of these Angel frames, like I said, uh, tell Andrew that you heard this on uh, the podcast and PPG Grandpa sent you, and he'll give you 200 bucks off. Like I said, don't tell anybody. This is just for you because you heard this podcast. Um, I think that we covered a lot of stuff. We're rolling up on one hour, which is crazy. It doesn't even feel like we talked for an hour. I truly appreciate your time, man, because I know that you know your time is really important to you, just like our... Um, 
our fans out there, uh, you're you listening to us for an hour. We really appreciate you. We're on iTunes. So if you are listening on iTunes, if you could go and uh, rate us, preferably a five-star would be very nice. We are on a bunch of other platforms. So whatever you're listening to, if you could rate us, I totally appreciate that five-star. And uh, get up with Andrew and get yourself uh, a setup with fi- with $200 off. You, you just can't beat that. And we have just crested an hour. So, so thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate your time. We definitely need to yap again. Yeah. And, uh, we'll catch you next time, man. Have a good one. All right, bud.